So today, the idea that psychology has taken from the Bible is this, and it's the title of the sermon if you're taking notes today. What you seek, you will find. What you seek, you will find. What it is that you're looking for, you will find. And I'm going to take the entire time today to dissect what I mean by that. So here's what Christianity says. This is how the Bible says that statement. In Matthew 7, 7, it says this, Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open unto you. In Jeremiah 29, 13, last week we talked about Jeremiah 29, 11. This is two verses later. It says this, uh, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And Deuteronomy 4.29 says this, But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Pretty much what this verse says is, what you seek, you will find. In the context of Christianity, in the context of the Bible, the primary focus of the thing that we are to seek is God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so this simply says, if you're looking for God, if you're looking for eternal life, you're going to find it, okay? But what if this idea of what you seek, you will find, is not just a biblical truth, but a principle of life, okay? A principle of life is something like sowing and reaping. Have you ever heard of that before, sowing and reaping? Okay. Uh, Sowing and reaping is not just a biblical thing. It's a reality of life. If you put an apple seed in the ground and water it, you will reap an apple tree. You sowed it, you reaped it. If you sow into your savings account that has high interest, you will reap uh, dividends or more money coming back. It's a principle that happens. And I believe that what you seek you will find is a principle of life. So now I'm going to shift in some psychology. I want to share with you two theories today, two ideas, two forms of study, and there's multiple ways, um, multiple different ways uh, that these studies have been performed, but we're going to look at two today. And the first is this, the bader mainhoff phenomenon. Has anybody ever heard of that before? The bader mainhoff phenomenon. Okay, you may not know that term, but you have certainly experienced it. Every single person in this world has experienced this. It's also known as frequency bias or the frequency illusion, and it's the idea of this. Once I obtain knowledge, I see that information everywhere. Okay? So... You've experienced this when you bought a new car. You were shopping. You're buying the most unique car. Nobody has this. You buy the car, and now it's everywhere. Everywhere on the highway. Bam, bam, bam. Your neighbor has it. Your boss has it. Your auntie has it. Now, the truth is they did not go out and buy it because you are a trendsetter, and now they all had to have the same car you're having. They had the car before you, but you didn't notice it until you learned the information. Now, that might not even be buying the car as much as you started studying and researching the safest car on the road. Now, all of a sudden, everybody has this car, whatever it is. Uh, You know, you go and you want to buy a really... uh, Real different pair of sneakers. Nobody has these sneakers yet. But you bought them at Finish Line at the Galleria Mall, and there's really only two places to go shopping for sneakers in Orange County. Now everybody has the sneakers that you just bought that were so different than everybody. It's the bader Mainhoff phenomenon or frequency biased. Now that I know something, I'm seeing it everywhere. Come on, right? The thing that I'm now looking for, I see it everywhere. The second theory that we want to look at today is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, okay? Confirmation bias is this. It's the tendency to notice information that confirms your pre-existing belief 
and ignores things that does not support your hypothesis, okay? Now, I'm just going to throw this out there, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to get anybody's business, but right now is like we're seeing it all over the place everywhere all the time, especially during election time. We're finding things that confirm what we always believed, and new data comes in, ah, I ain't believing that. We reject new information that does not support what we know. But once we believe something, we will look to find it everywhere, even if it's not there. Let me explain. You feel that everybody at work hates you. Everybody's talking about you. So... You walk into work one day, there's a group of your coworkers standing there talking, you walk in the door, they look up, <laughs> start laughing, and go back to their conversation. What did you just feel? They're laughing at you. They're laughing at you. And you say to yourself, see, I knew it. I knew they were talking about me. I knew everybody around here hates me. When the reality is that the, one of the people had already told a joke before you walked in the door, and the second you hit the door, the person said the punchline, they were going to laugh anyway, but your confirmation bias says, it was about me. It was about me. Everybody's talking about me. We see this today when it comes to the ability to worship freely in church. Come on, let's talk about this for a second. Got a good song. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise. And we, and we get, night in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker. Because I can't dance in church because everybody's watching me. Everybody's looking at me, right? But when, when reality and the truth is, and it's kind of aggravating to me, like I've been down on Front Street in Newburgh for dinner on a Friday night or a Saturday night, and I've seen some of you all to like some, some ungodly music. Ah, ah. But then we walk into church, Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep. Because everybody's going to laugh at me if I, Waymaker, if I do a little, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's this idea of being paralyzed in what we want to do because of our thoughts, because of how we feel about ourselves. And these biases, these way that we view the world, are on everything. It's how we operate about everything. The truth is, what we're looking at today is this, what you seek, you will find. If you're looking for the bad, you will find the bad. All right, let me explain. Another one, I'm not gonna get too much into detail on this one, but most of us have done this as well. Uh, there's an item that you want to buy, so you go to the greatest store that's ever existed, Amazon. You first scroll to the ones that have prime shipping so you can get it in two days or less. But the first thing you do when you find the item that you want to buy on Amazon, read the reviews. Read the reviews. Let me find out what everybody else says about this product that I want. And for some reason, we've got to read the negative ones. We've got to look at the ones or the zeros to find out what's wrong with this item. And then I get to myself and I'm like, so do you want to buy the item or do you not want to buy the item? You say you want to buy the item, but you want to look at everything negative that everyone has to say to try to talk you out of buying it. Because if you look for the bad, you'll find the bad. If you look for the good, you'll find the good. You'll find the good of five people who really enjoy this product. It's the best thing ever. And then there's like 55 people who hate it, but they didn't even know that you had to recharge the batteries. They didn't read the, they didn't read the, the, the owner's manual that came with the product, but will believe the negative 
because that's what we look for. It goes back to the old saying, is the, cl- is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Because what you seek, you will find. The Apostle Paul wrote to us in the book of Philippians in A.D. 61. In A.D. 61, Paul was imprisoned in Rome and he penned a, a letter to a church that he had founded in AD 51. This church was about 10 years old. It was one of his favorite places to preach. He loved this church. And he sits down to write them a letter. And this is what Paul writes in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So let's take the next few minutes and let's dissect this verse. The first word of this verse says, finally. So like all good preachers, he's telling you, in closing, I'm about to close, but he doesn't really close. He talks for another 20 verses. In closing, I'm about to close, my final words on this topic are this. But we have to understand, what's the topic? Finally, here, I'm closing out this topic. Here here it is. Here's the answer to everything about what I've been saying. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is a good report, whatever is uh, excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. But what was the topic? The topic of the book of Philippians was joy. Joy. How to rejoice during tough times. How to rejoice during persecution. Uh, Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. This is what he's talking about. So watch what he says here. He says, finally, here it is, to sum it all up. If you want joy in your life, think about what's true. If you want joy, think about what's noble. If you want joy, think about things that are right. If you want joy, think about things that are pure. If you want joy, think about things that are lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Christian joy is independent of outward conditions and it is possible in the midst of adverse circumstances and that, w- that is what Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. Think about things that are true, noble, pure, lovely, admirable. If you seek these things, then you will have a joy-filled life. Now, if that is true, which I believe it is, then the opposite is also true. If we keep seeking things that are false, things that are lies, things that are hateful, things that are nasty, then you will not experience joy. Can I just throw out an example maybe? Maybe you were watching CNN or Fox News all day long. Okay, most, most joy-filled two channels in the entire cable, cable package. Watching that information all day long, and then your child comes home from school, opens the door, and is just screaming in joy. Are you like, oh my God, I've just been watching the most life-filled information. Give me a hug. No, sometimes like, Shh, sh- well, why is everybody got to scream around here? Watch my news. Come on, somebody. I'm just throwing this out there. Just throwing this out there. Because watching anger breeds anger. Feeding anger grows more anger. You will experience the things that you are looking for. Now, I've got some issues with Paul. I got some issues with Paul and what he wrote to the church of Philippi. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is butterflies and cupcakes. Huh, come on. Whatever is roses, think about these things. And I have a problem 
Because yes, I'm a Christian, but I'm also a New Yorker. And that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different, all right? I think that maybe somebody from Texas can do what Paul said a little bit easier. No? Uh, let, let, me, let me illustrate. Let me illustrate to you, okay? Maybe, maybe you were raised the same way I was raised. Don't talk to strangers. Huh? You got to open your, your, your candy at Halloween time and cut it open and make sure there's nothing in it. A lot of messed up people in the world. Got to keep your front door locked, even when you're home. Because after all, we live in New York. We don't live in heaven. Huh? How do I then believe what is pure and lovely and true and cupcakes when I was taught? Don't trust nobody. Keep your hand on your pocket and keep your cash in your front pocket. Like, how do I do both being raised the way that we were? I got a problem with the teachings of Jesus. He says if someone smites you, which means punk slaps you in the face, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Maybe they do that in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> but like in New York, we walk, like we got a chip on our shoulder about everything. If, 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 if your cappuccino takes more than five minutes, you're upset. Huh? So we're in this struggle, we're in this dilemma. I want to be full of joy, but I've also been programmed by my upbringing to be very negative. To be self-protective, to view the world and see things a certain way. So let me ask you a question today. And it's gonna take a little bit. It's gonna take a little bit of soul searching. But who taught you to think the way you think? Who taught you to think the way that you think? So I'm just gonna illustrate for me my dad always taught me, and this is not right or wrong, it's just the way my dad taught me, to keep your wallet in your back pocket and your money in your front pocket. I, I just, that, that's how he raised me. I, my dad has never put his money in his wallet. He's like, someone could take your wallet, but they don't have your money. That's just, this is how he always raised me. So, that's the way I think, and that's the way I raise my kids. I didn't sit back and question it. It's just the way the McKelveys do. McKelveys do what McKelveys do. That's, that, that, that's how we are. But who taught you to think the way you think? Who taught you, don't talk to strangers, check your Halloween candy, lock the front door. Was it mom and dad? Was it an aunt or uncle? Was it a grandparent? Who? Maybe, that, maybe you have formed your own views and your own biases based upon past experiences. Maybe you were treated a certain way as a child. Maybe you were bullied or picked on. And so because of that, you formed certain views and certain, certain beliefs about how you needed to live. But somebody certainly in your life took the lenses that they viewed the world and gave them to you. And said, this is how you need to see the world. This is how you need to see circumstances around you. And my idea today is this. If someone, if a person or a group of people was responsible for teaching you how to think and how to view the world, then someone else or another group of people can be responsible for changing the way you think. We can change the way we think. We can change the way we view the world. We can change the way we view others. And here's an inside tip. That's the purpose of the Bible. In fact, we're instructed, renew your mind to the word of God daily. It's the instructions. It is the purpose of 
the Bible. I want to share a verse with you today that if you've been in church any uh, amount of time, you've heard this before, but probably not in this context. It's in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, and it says this. Today, I have given you the, what? Choice. Choice. Choice is a very, very, very powerful word. Choice. I've given you a choice. We all want that in just another few weeks when it's voting time. A choice. I have given you the choice between life and death, between good thoughts and bad thoughts, between joy or sadness, between blessing and curses. He says this, now I call on heaven and earth as a witness. He says, make your choice. Make your choice. Make a choice. And, and, and here, the sentence structure, go to the next screen. The sentence structure here, this word oh here, is now it's like oh. It's oh that you would choose life. That's kind of how they would say there. I lay before you a choice, but oh that you would choose life. Oh that you would choose joy. Oh that you would choose the things that are godly so that you and your descendants might live. But let me tell you what my reality was. I honestly believe that I did not have a whole lot of choices about how I felt in life. In fact, I'm really good at blaming other people for the way I am. I'm really good at blaming other people for my mistakes and my failures. I'm really, really, really good at it, and so are some of you. Well, I wouldn't be this way if... Well, I wouldn't have yelled if you didn't. And because I lived with a victim mentality, it's never my fault why I am the way that I am. If someone didn't hurt me, I wouldn't be this way. And so in my life, this led to coping with pain in ways that don't really line with the word of God. I'm just being transparent with somebody here today, all right? Well, if my parents were nicer to me, I wouldn't be. If, if so-and-so didn't yell like, like that, I wouldn't have yelled back. And he says, no, you have a choice. I didn't think I had a choice feeling the way that I felt. Come on, somebody. I thought that if this happens, then this is just how I respond to it. But the word of God says I have a choice. I do not have to yell back at someone that yelled at me. I do not have to hurt someone because they hurt me. I am in control of me. I am in control, listen to this, listen to this because you're not, you're not gonna like this one. I am in control of defining the words that you say at me. You don't get to define the words that you say at me. But because we've all accepted the same dictionary, when someone says to me, you're a loud mouth. You're a loud mouth. That's a negative thing. But if I said, oh, I'm a loud mouth, guess what? I get paid to be a loud mouth. So you can be trying to put me down. You can be trying to hurt me with your words. Or I can redefine the words to a life that is full of joy for me. Come on, somebody. This isn't an easy message because this makes us work. It's easier for me to blame somebody else. I was having a little, can I, I'm just going to be a little honest. This is second service. I can talk to you guys. First service, I got to be more religious. <laughs> I was having a little pity party last week. Uh, before COVID, we were like breaking over 2,500 on a weekend. 
like really growing, bringing new, new um, groups and events and different things into the church. And I was sitting back and I'm like, yo, we lost like almost the whole church for something that wasn't even my fault. It's one thing that a couple hundred people leave because I preached a bad sermon. But I didn't cause COVID. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sitting back and I'm like angry at this thing because it was out of my control. But what I can control is my response to the situation. You know what I can control? What I can control is making the kingdom of darkness pay for splitting the church. I can control that. Dr. Caroline Leaf, she's, a, she, she's one of the leading uh, doctors in brain science. She says this, as we think, we change the physical nature of our brain. I don't know if you knew that or not, but as you think, you create new entrails in your mind and connect different parts of your brain. That's why when someone teaches something and it clicks with you or the light bulb goes off, they literally did. It literally made a connection in your brain and changed the structure of your brain. It, it literally happens. Is this crazy? As we consciously direct our thinking, we can wire out toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with healthy thoughts. So, I'm gonna throw something out there to you, okay? Now, I'm sure this has never happened to anybody in here, but let's just say that you used to date somebody and you liked them a lot, and then you broke up. Well, you go and you see that somehow you're walking down the street or whatever and you see them and all of a sudden it takes your breath away and you're like trying to hide from them because all these feelings and these emotions came back that you thought you dealt with but you didn't because you've allowed yourself to keep thinking about them. You, you had allowed yourself to keep thinking, I wonder what they're doing. I mean, I'll check their Facebook. I mean, I'll just check their Instagram. You know, I'm, I'm, not, no, I'm not interested. I'm all good. I just want, maybe let's see what's up. But, but what you've done is you're, you're continuing to have those connections in your brain. Now, someone who's actually moved on, they delete the person's Facebook, they delete their Instagram, they never think about them, they've moved on. They walk by that same kind of person, they feel nothing because they've rewired, they've wired out the toxic thoughts and feelings and they've wired in new thoughts and connections. It's actual brain science. It's not just emotion. This is what she says. In essence, she says, science is proving free will and the relationship between thoughts and reality. The relationship between thoughts and reality. Now, I want to tell you this. Whether by experience or desire, you create your current reality. Whether by past experience or desires of what I want, I create my current reality. I feel the way that I feel because of the thoughts that I keep thinking. I think people are talking about me because I keep thinking that they're talking about me. Romans 12, 10, uh, 2 tells us this. Do not copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And how does he do that? Through his word. He will change the way you think, but you got to open the book. You got to open the book. He's not going to open your brain and drop it in. All right? Change the way you think. Changing the way you think changing, changes your perspective, which changes how you act in the world. Change the way you think, it changes your perspective and changes how you act in the world. If you keep thinking about being a victim, you will live in a victimizing world. And Paul's words aren't new. 
He echoes the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, changing your thinking. He says to people, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's telling us, change your thinking, God is here. Change your thinking, God is here. Jesus challenged people to change their thinking because regardless of how many times you read the Bible, if your mind doesn't change, you will impose your bias on those scriptures. Go ahead and read some of the New Testament with the belief that God is angry and you will find all the verses that God is angry. But if you take those same verses with new lenses and say God loves me and cares for me, it changes. Let's look at one. Let's look at one verse. The book of Hebrews. It says that after you're saved, if you keep on continually sinning, there can never again be a second sacrifice for sin. Okay? So, if God is angry and uh, every time you mess up, you have to run to the altar and cry and repent and ask for forgiveness, then that verse says, once you're a Christian, if you mess up, no hope. You're the dog that returned to his vomit. There can never again be another sacrifice. Lost your salvation. Or, if you understand the belief that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life, then I can read that verse and it says this, that those who come to the knowledge of God continue to willfully sin, there can never again be a second sacrifice because the sacrifice was so complete the first time that he could never go to the cross because it was done once and for all. Same verse, different lenses. Same verse, different belief on the power of God. It's the power of choice that God gave us. We have the power to choose what we think about and how we focus on it. What you look for, you will find. What you think about will become your reality. As we wrap things up today, I want to look again at the power of choice all the way in the beginning of time. God gave Adam a job way back in the beginning. He said, Adam, here's your job. Name all the animals. Name all the animals. He gave a name to animals. Walked around, you're a lion, you're a tiger, you're a bear. Oh, my. Sorry. So if man named things, and maybe there's some things in our lives that have very powerful names, like depression, anxiety, fear, insecurity, shyness. If man created a name, then don't I have the power to rename it? Don't I have the power to rename it? Huh? You know, th there's a name, there's, there's a name that makes me so angry that when parents say it in front of me, I actually, I correct anybody. I don't care who they are. I will correct every single parent if they curse their child with a certain name and it's called shy. Shy. You're cursing your children by giving them the name shy. So I'll tell you what happens. I'll walk up to a kid and I'll be like, hey, man, so great to see you. And they go and they hide behind their mom's leg or their dad's leg. And mom or dad says, oh, no, it's okay. Don't mind them. They're shy. No, they're not. No, they're not. Just some big, loud mouth, scary guy got all up in their grill. <laughs> and you taught them, don't talk to strangers. You're a New Yorker. So now they did what you said, but now you called them shy. So now that kid grows up, and they're older, and we say, man, we would love to have some new singers on our stage and some new band members. I would love to, but I'm shy. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm introvert. I would love to sing. I sing at home in the shower so beautifully, but I could never because my mom called me shy and hid me behind her leg. So rename it. Rename it. You ain't shy. You ain't shy when you got your music on at home and you're vacuuming. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba 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 -da -ba -ba. You ain't shy. You've accepted a name that wasn't yours. The name shy, insecure, uh, uncommitted. Those were never your names. It's something someone else put on you. Rename it. Change the name. In closing, I want to go back and look at the first three verses that we spoke about. In light of our new lenses, Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, you ask, and you will receive. You seek, and you will find. You knock, and the door will be open to you. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me, and then you will find me when you seek me with your heart. Deuteronomy 4, 29, but if, if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him when you seek him with your whole heart. He says, this is the power of your choice. You will find the thing that you seek, whether you're seeking the good or you're seeking the bad. What's the old saying? If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You're right. You will find the thing you're looking for. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus today. I pray, God, that you would continue to help us to renew our minds to the word of God, that we would adopt the beliefs and the viewpoints of the scripture and allow it to change the way that we've been viewing things around us. I pray that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. Even during this season of life, I pray that we can experience overwhelming joy as we keep our minds set on the things of God. Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that we are blessed. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Love you.